fans, and welcome to another edition of John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight Podcast. The Pro Wrestling Spotlight covered all the news stories and breaking developments that happened in real time, and now we relive those moments right here on this podcast. Today, we will take a look back at the life of superstar Billy Graham. Graham passed away after years of debilitating illnesses and injury on May 17th. He was a game changer in the history of pro wrestling. His look, his charisma, his ability to cut unforgettable promos revolutionized the business. Wayne Coleman was an award-winning bodybuilder in the 1960s when he decided to wrestle professionally, making his debut in Calgary on January 16, 1970. His star rose steadily as he made his way through the territories from Los Angeles with Mike LaBelle promoting, teaming with Dr. Jerry Graham, and that's when uh, Coleman changed his name to Billy Graham. Graham worked Florida, San Francisco, the AWA in the early to mid-70s with stops in Texas as well, but it was not until 1975 when superstar Billy Graham became one of the biggest drawing cards ever as he entered the Worldwide Wrestling Federation. Today, We'll be discussing Billy with the Hall of Fame photographer, my dear friend, my mentor, one of a kind, Mr. George Napolitano. Uh, And later, we will be uh, talking to Keith Elliott Greenberg, who wrote Billy's biography with Billy. And that book came out in 2007. So Keith will be joining us later on as well. But before we get to George and to Keith, We pulled a clip, and it's just a random clip, but it shows you the promo abilities of superstar Billy Graham. So why don't we go to that clip, and then we're going to bring on George Napolitano. And then, of course, the main event to end all main events. Perhaps the greatest main event of all time as Bruno Sammartino returns to the Philadelphia Spectrum, opposing... The reigning Worldwide Rusting Federation heavyweight champion superstar, Billy Graham. And right now, let's bring on Mr. Graham here to my right, along with the Grand Wizard of Wrestling. And one week from tonight, Mr. Graham, are you ready for it? I'm ready. I look ready. I feel ready. Time is running out. You were right. The announcer is right. Only one week left. One week could be a fateful day, doomsday. That's the people in the city of Philadelphia predicted. It could be doomsday for superstar Billy Graham. But now I'm going to get down with you, Bruno San Martino. For you to get this belt back, for you to get it back, you're going to have to beat me down so bad. And I got a lot of power left. I got a lot of strength left. I got a lot of desire left. A lot of heart left. A lot of soul left. And a lot of 22-inch bicep left. What are you going to do with his arm? What will you do with 22 inches of solid steel wrapped around your head? You're going to give up? That's what you do. You're going to holler, uncle, surrender. And I will retain the belt. Right with the- Absolutely correct. Bruno, you are a defeated man. You are an ex-champion. You are like yesterday. Superstar Billy Graham, certainly one of the best uh, talkers in the world of pro wrestling. Uh, one of the best photographers in the history of professional wrestling is about to join us, and he joins us from up in the Northeast. He's my friend. He's my mentor. He's somebody I've known for 50 years, George Napolitano, or George Napolitano, I should say. Uh, let's bring George on right now. Hey, John, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to your show. Hey, it's a pleasure, George. I mean, uh, you and I have traveled the roads uh, together in the mid-70s. I mean, uh, you were, to me, uh, one of the mentors. You opened up so many doors for me, created access for me. Uh, We sat together at Madison Square Garden at ringside when I was just a teenager. Uh, But uh, our adventures on the road, uh, the introductions that you made to me over the course of all of the years I was in the business will never be forgotten. I'm so happy to Thank see you. Thank you, Tony. Thank yeah. you. It was uh, it was my pleasure. Yeah. It was good um, to have somebody to travel with. Yeah. I also yeah. remember traveling with you, going to Boston to see Paul McCartney at the right. Boston Gardens. Yes. And, Wings over America. And also Billy Joel. That is right. Absolutely. I, re- <laughs> I remember that uh, that concert in, in Boston uh, because we actually stayed at my college dorm. 
Okay, yeah. how's that? <laughs> On Ken and Kenmore Square. Uh, and that's where we uh, stayed that night. And uh, I do remember the McCartney show. We had pretty good seats. We're side stage. On, and On the side of the stage, looking mm -hmm. straight in. Yeah. Because I couldn't get a ticket. And you said you can get tickets in Boston. And I said, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm driving up there. And, and we went. I also kind of remember selling pictures outside the Boston Gardens of Billy Joel. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, we uh, yeah, we shot shot some eight pictures. Eight by ten photos. Eight by ten photos, yeah, and we were selling those <laughs> outside. That was that's correct. Wow, great memory, great memory. Uh, that's in addition to wrestling, of course. I mean, the shows that we went together, and of course, across the country, it wasn't just mm -hmm. Madison Square Garden. Um, but uh, many times, especially in 75 and, and after, you know, we drive to Philly together. I drive to Brooklyn uh, and, uh, you know, we drive to Philly back and forth and uh, sometimes go to Hamburg as well. And uh, but the uh, adventures that we've had and the tra tra travels that we've made in places like Texas and even St. Louis, which we'll talk about a little bit, because uh, that's night we, we had uh, in 77 in St. Louis. We had dinner with Billy that night and. He was there to work against uh, handsome Jimmy Valiant. Uh, so a long, a long, long history. And, and it was so wonderful to see you at 80s WrestleCon uh, a few weeks back. Uh, always a pleasure to see you. And, of course, we both have that affinity and love for the New York Mets. Oh, and we forget having uh, box seats for the Mets. We used to share Box seats. That's we did actually. We did. A couple of years. Spent a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, I think it was two seventy one. It was out in right field, if I if I'm not mistaken, right? It was more between third base and uh, and right field. A little bit closer to the foul pole. Yeah, it wasn't on. It, it was in right right field. And what was Actually, that? The late eighties was late eighties after the World Series victory. 87, 88, 89, I want to say. Yeah, yeah. And I used to take pictures, and you used to sit with Gregory, my son. Yes, exactly, exactly. And you're still, uh, you're still shooting baseball. You still, yeah. I, I don't go as often as I used to, but uh, I still go, and I still have my season credential. I I get in, yeah. But it's not the, like everything else. It's not the same. Yeah. Do you still do any work for the Brooklyn Cyclones? Yes, I do. And uh, I used to be the photographer full time. Now uh, I go occasionally. And, and I went Tuesday night. I was there Tuesday night. So I'll go a couple times uh, homestand, mm -hmm. but not every game. Just when if there's a, a player coming up on rehab, if they need something, I'll go. Or just just to go two, maybe two times a homestand. And you cover so many entertainment events now in New York City premieres, movie premieres. You're out, you're out there, and you're working uh, big events now in New York since wrestling. And there's no more wrestling magazines, really, so uh, uh, that's unfortunate. But uh, you still keep active as a photographer, shooting the entertainment world. Yeah, it, it, a lot of movie premieres, concert shows. I, I go to a lot of the bigger events, and it's it's fun. It really is. Yeah. Well, it's great to see you, and unfortunately, you know, we're here to talk about uh, uh, the passing of superstar Billy Graham, who uh, left us uh, just a few weeks ago, and uh, you, probably more than anyone else, had this incredible relationship with superstar Billy Graham, a real confidant of his, uh, uh, so many memories, and I want to start off with, you know, how you first met Billy, where was that? And okay, this, that will, go, this will go back to your opening. I actually met him in Houston, Texas. He was working in the AWA and you mentioned Houston. Well, you mentioned Texas. Yeah. He used to do the big shows for Paul Bosch in Houston. And that's where I met him. I met him at first at a show in, in Houston for Paul Bosch. I want to say 74, 75. 74. Sure exactly. Mm -hmm. 74. Before coming to New York. I did pictures. I did an interview and uh, had his address and I mailed him when the magazine came out and he was ecstatic on the, being a magazine. Like he thought he was a big deal. And uh, then he called me to tell me that he was going to be in New York at a world bodybuilding competition. Dan Laurie okay. used to run a bodybuilding competition every year and uh, superstar was going to be one of the contestants. So I picked him up at the airport and drove him to the 
bodybuilding event, which he didn't win. He he placed though. He didn't win. But this was like 75 then, early 75? before he wrestled in the WWWF. So it was mid-75 probably. Before he wrestled, yes. And uh, he didn't win, he thought, because of his legs. His legs weren't as chiseled <laughs> as the rest of his body. Wow. He used to, he used to work on his, the upper, upper body. Yes. He, he wasn't as chiseled in his legs, and he felt that was his detriment why he didn't win. He said, I should have won, I should have won. But he, he showed he placed really well. And uh, right after that, he went back to the AWA. And uh, a couple of weeks later, he calls me up and says that he's coming to New York. I'm going to work for the WWWF. Pick me up at the airport. And me picked him up at the airport. And that's how it started. That's how it started. That's how it started, me becoming his chauffeur. <laughs> yeah, funny. I mean, did you, uh, you know, obviously you've seen everybody everyone you know from the rookies all the way up to the champions and super you know the, the real you know the superstars uh did you notice when you first met billy that there was this something special about this yeah, guy if you look if you looked at him you knew he was an athlete he was big muscular blonde hair and he uh, he had a little more blonde hair than he had later but uh but having to look the musc musc muscularity you knew he was an athlete of some sort. Even if you didn't know wrestling, you knew he was more than just the average person walking the streets. Yeah, and he was a gifted talker right from the start. Well, yeah, he, he his interviews were, and you mentioned about his interviews, his interviews were non-scripted. It would come from the top of his head. He wasn't given a script and told what to say. I know earlier, you, I think you played something about some city. And all you had to do when you do your interview was make sure you mentioned the city Mention the arena and mention the time. And anything else, you fill it in any way you want. And he definitely filled it in. Yeah. And the so, mouthpiece was the Grand Wizard of Wrestling, which we'll get into in a little bit also. Yeah, he, he was uh, a great talker as well. Well, the Grand Wizard was actually my first. He was my, he was my mentor. He introduced me to everybody. So having the Grand Wizard as his manager made it even that much more uh, yeah, easier. Obviously, uh uh, you know, the Grand Wizard, uh, Ernie, uh, <clears throat> you know, obviously validated you, but you were already validated. But, you know, it kind of, uh, you know, it, it, it was such a closed business back then. And uh, to for the guys to trust anyone in the business uh, was really special. And, of course, you were beloved by everybody. Um, so we'll, we'll go to that um, time when Billy and Billy actually made his debut. Uh, I don't know if you were there or not. I was there. His first match uh, for the WWWF was in Boston uh, when he teamed up with uh, Spiro Sarion in a tag team match against uh, Bruno San Martino and Dominic DiNucci. And uh, that was, uh, I believe, in, an o in October of 75. Uh, uh, that was before his garden debut. And he and he pinned Bruno in the middle of the ring in that first match. I'll never forget it. Uh, so I don't know. Were you there or not? Well, I, definitely, I, I definitely was not there. But I want to say that probably three days later, he was in uh, Philadelphia. For TV. Philadelphia Arena for TV. Yeah. Which I was, and I took him there. And I drove him. You did. Okay. So, uh, so, so right from the start, you you developed a friendship right from the start. Uh, you and Billy, uh, he trusted you, and uh, you became a dear friend of his. Yeah, and uh, he spent many a night at my house in be in between wrestling dates, and at that time there weren't that much. And he would uh, he would eat the food that my wife prepared. My wife would cook, and uh, Billy liked eating home cooked meals in my house. <laughs> well, that's a spent a lot of time with you in Brooklyn. Uh, that day in December in uh, 1975, uh, Billy Graham came to New York. You picked him up, I'm sure. And uh, I happened to be uh, a tag along in the car that day. And I do remember uh, Billy having to go to the New York State Athletic Commission and get his license. So. I I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, that was, many I, was there, I was there with you and Billy. I was in the car with you. And uh, and for me, I mean, I was just 
I was shy around the guys anyway. You know, I was just a kid at the time. And and just having uh, that experience for me is something I'll never forget. It was like his first day in New York City getting his wrestler's license for Madison Square Gardens. Uh, you had to have a license. Night. You had to have a license. New York yeah, State Commission. You definitely had to have you a had license. You had to produce the card in order to wrestle in anywhere in New York State. Yeah. Besides being getting a uh, getting examined by a doctor, which was there every, every match. Right. It certainly was. I mean, those rules in New York City were strict, uh, and the athletic commission was there, and uh, the rules were here too, very much so. Uh, but um, 50, it was like 48 years ago, George, that he made his debut at the Garden. And uh, Well, I'm taking pictures over 50 years. Yes. You started really, I mean, even before, you, you started like professionally shooting in like 69 or 70. Yes, that's it. 1969 and uh, 1970, uh, Sunnyside Gardens, I met somebody. Who, who worked for Ring Magazine. He says, oh, you must have great pictures. You got a good camera. I said, no, nah, I don't know. He says, well, let me see them next time you come. And I went to Sunnyside Gardens the next time I brought this photo. He says, you want to work with me? For Ring Magazine. And that's how it started. I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> I just knew that, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do this thing. <laughs> and then you become... A Hall of Fame photographer. I mean, your career has been storied, but uh, an interesting thing from that from that night. Uh, well, I just want to stop you one second. Sure. Uh, and you, you you said Hall of Fame photographer, but everybody says I'm a photographer. I'm a photographer, but they they don't realize how much I wrote, <laughs> how many stories I wrote in that magazine. I use all kinds of names and places. Well, you used to write I'm like just, you used to write six to ten magazines a month. Yeah, well, depending on the time, the place, or the year. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm noticed this this great photographer, which is all good and well. Yeah, but they forget that I used to for every day, everything I took, I used to write. Yeah, I used to write stories, do the interviews, do uh, do an interview on a cassette tape, and then I would transcribe the the uh, the, the interview, and I would write what they said. I didn't write what I thought. I write what they said. They said crazy, outlandish things, and that's what I wrote. Yeah. I didn't make them up in my head or have somebody tell me, oh, why don't you say he was uh, an Indian fighter or something but that along those lines. Yeah, a lot of the guys back then were like, write what you want, you know, or whatever it is. But uh, to, to have it the was, actual it was easier. It was easier for me to write what they say than for me to make up all that uh, – that they, they, they were saying. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm going to go back in time with you to that first Madison Square Garden show, the night that he beat uh, Dominic DiNucci in nine seconds, his Madison Square Garden debut. Uh, I was backstage. You were backstage. Uh, there was a guy named Stan Friedman, which I think you remember, right? I remember the name. You mentioned the name. Is Stan Friedman or, is, or, or who was the guy that was with the Dan Laurie bodybuilding match? No, that would have been later, and that was Scott, Scott Epstein. Epstein. Okay. And if, if you just – an aside, if you remember what I said earlier, that it was a Dan Laurie bodybuilding competition. Yes. That's how it started. So then they, they wrote pro wrestling. Um, I forgot the name of the magazine. It's just uh, the tip of my tongue. Uh, yeah, body which was the bodybuilding magazine. That was yeah. a wrestling magazine. Yeah, R wrestling. I forget at the moment, but uh, wrestling illustrated. It wasn't pro wrestling not, illustrated. No, was it wrestling illustrated was something else. Yeah, it'll come to me before before it ends. But that's he wasn't around then. But he did have his own magazine at that time. So yeah. this could this could actually be on this tape. You and Scott talking to Bill. I, I can hear the voice. I can tell you. Okay. So we're going to go back uh, 50 years to December of 1975 when Billy Graham made his debut at Madison Square Garden. This was before the matches. And it was an interview that I put on cassette as well. And uh, we're going to play it right now. So we'll go back 50 years to listen to George uh, talking to superstar Billy Graham. Our last interview of the day is with the one and only superstar Billy Graham. This is the surprise interview of the day. So listen now to the one and only superstar Billy Graham. This is the whole thing behind uh, the reason I'm here from the very start, man. The last of Bruno Astrofell. 
it'll, it'll make it the sport that it really is. I, it'll finally get the recognition you see with me as the champion and a greater body behind it. Do you understand you're going to some kind of competition with Dan Murray? Yeah. I'll be, I'll be competing in the professional Mr. America contest uh, September 13th in New York. Uh, Dan Lurie, president of the World Bodybuilding Guild, and that'll be my first competition uh, as a uh, first stepping stone to uh, later on the Mr. Universe, Mr. World contest. As a professional, can you compete in the Mr. Universe contest? There's a clip of uh, 50 years ago, man. John, he's, everything he said in that clip, he, he, he proved it and he did it. He did have the best physique in wrestling. And yep. he, won, he did win the belt. And uh, he he did train. That was his big thing. He would, after the matches at night, he would then go across the street to the deli and get food, get lettuce and salad and all kinds of uh, vegetarian kind of meals. And he would not he would not go to the bars and hang out at that time late at night. He would get up early in the morning and train two, three hours a day. That was his biggest thing, training. Yeah, he wasn't uh, a night owl. Uh, when uh, the garden shows were over with, we'd go the Edison Hotel, and I believe Billy stayed at the Howard Johnson's. At the Howard Johnson. And, and that was on Eighth uh, Avenue, wasn't it? And, uh, he he used the Howard Johnson as his residence, traveling through the circuit. Howard Johnson was his residence, and my home was his home address. Your home. Yes, he would use my address at home as his home address, and uh, many <laughs> he would get many things in my address, and I would deliver them. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're like a courier. He's getting all this mail at your house. You're hanging out. He's living in a hotel in Manhattan, and uh, that must be a special time for you, though, as you get close to Billy Graham. And I mean. Tell us you know, more about the friendship. I mean, he trusted you. He trusted you. Well, see, because I, I didn't ask him questions. I mean, I, he, yeah. he did his thing. I did my thing. And uh, if I did an interview like like we just like we just heard, I would write what he said. It was easier to write what he said in his interview than to me to make up my own quotes and my own writing. Yeah. He said everything there that uh, – that came to be. I mean, we 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 were actually friendly. He used to he used to play with my kids, uh, Gregory, and then later Joseph. He would play with them, toss them around. And uh, I remember once, he uh, his his daughter it was a was a little older than my son Gregory, and he gave us the high chair to feed the, because she didn't need the high chair anymore, and he gave us the high chair to use. Uh, and, uh, as a and bicycle and all kinds of extra stuff that he had. So it, was, it was more than just a professional. It was personally you ate at your home. You yeah, yeah. got his mail. So you guys were, were pretty, pretty tight. Um, in regard to, you know, obviously your photography, your writing, uh, but he was to me, even as I was shooting pictures, he was the best subject because he knew where the camera was at all times. John, John he, he made sure if he had somebody in a headlock, he would mm -hmm. turn them around. He knew exactly where the camera was. And he would look, and then he would give me a, a shake his head, nod his head. I would shake or put my hand, put a thumb up, and he knows I got the picture for the cover. He for needed, the cover. <laughs> he needed he always had, he needed that picture for the cover, of course. Did, did, you get it? did you get it? He would turn the opponent around, and he, sometimes he would say, hey, we're going to be on the cover, and he would just move them. So that we get the shot. His uh, ring entrances, and especially with the Wiz, I mean, he'd wear a different outfit every time at Madison Square Garden, and he knew he'd looked at you, <laughs> and he looked at the photographers at ringside. But he would pose, he would flex. Those were incredible shots. Yeah, but see, be, be, before, I mean, there were some colorful guys, but most of the time, people just wore trunks or wore a long robe. Yeah. He brought color. It was the 70s. It was. He was the epitome of the 70s. Look, style, charisma. He had it all of that. And he was part of that era. He was. Yeah, definitely a, a groundbreaking, trendsetting. What can you say? I mean, he had that run initially in the WWF, and then he comes back uh, in 1977. And you have a fascinating story about 
April 30th of 1977. He was booked in Baltimore and oh, okay. he, he calls your he calls you up to say, hey, oh, listen. Go. We're going to drive to Baltimore. Uh, drive me, drive me. Uh, I said, oh, come on. So I said, okay. And I drove him to Baltimore. And as we're, as we're driving there, he says, um, hope you got a lot of film. I said, come on, please. You're wrestling Bruno. He says, I am wrestling Bruno. I hope you have a lot of film. Today. I says, why do I need film? I got enough pictures of you and Bruno, more than I can ever use. Ah, oh, you're going to need, tonight's going to be different. Yeah, come on, please. We're going to Baltimore. We're not going to the garden. So he didn't tip you off. Listen, when they say people knew, they knew this, they knew that, a lot of it is baloney. Yeah. Because they really didn't tell. He told me, but didn't tell me. Yeah, he told you in a roundabout way, but didn't he tell told you. Me. You he haven't left film for tonight. He didn't say, I'm going to win tonight. I'm going to beat him. You're going to look at me. No. But he told me, make sure I had a lot of film and be ready. And I'm always ready. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that wasn't the case. Always ready. And uh, th th and when he did win, he turned, he looked at me. And again, he gave me the nod. Like, yeah. And then he went out of the ring. And contrary to what it's in a book, I understand his book says that he then – People were going crazy, and he took a, he took a cab to his hotel. Well, I'm sorry to say that's not the way it happened. I got called to the back immediately, and uh, he he just toweled off. He never changed. He got in the car with his ring. And he was gear. bleeding and everything. He, he he got in the car with his ring gear, no and we drove uh, down the uh, Jersey Turnpike, Baltimore. And uh, we celebrated by in the, eating in the rest stop. <laughs> that was a big celebration, eating in the rest stop. He did not go home, and uh, the people were not up in arms. It was, it was, they were, they didn't know what happened. When you were there, you saw him leave with the belt, but in your own, in your mind, you had to think they're going to take it back. Because he had his foot on the ropes when he yeah. pinned Bruno. Yeah. But they didn't. And uh, well, that but but you would think that because that that yeah. would happen, you and they, yeah. they would recall it the next day. Remember, again, and nothing against Baltimore, but it wasn't Madison Square Garden, we we're yeah. at the Baltimore Civic Center, and uh, you're not going to see the great Bruno lose to superstar in Baltimore. You right. think that was a shock, it was yeah. uh, almost as shocking as when well, maybe more shocking when Koloff pinned Bruno in '71, but yeah. this was um. But this it was, was the same kind of reaction. Co yeah, it was quiet, the, calm. Quiet. You know, again, you didn't expect it. There was no riot. It wasn't like the Dick yeah. the Bruiser and the Sheik and uh, people rioted. No, you can say what you want, but it wasn't that way. Yeah. And by this time, Billy had, uh, I believe, purchased a home on Long Island or rented a home on Long Island. Yeah, um, he, had, he had a home, but it, it was hard to get to Long Island. Long, I think it was in Long Beach. Okay. It was hard to get back and forth from Long Beach to all the spots that he had to go. And that's why he used, uh, he, again, he used the Howard Johnson as his main, uh, his main residency. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the day after, um, the day after he won, we went to a, a photography, went to a photo studio where I took pictures of himself with the belt the first time, the first pictures. And then we went to his house because a little while later, it was going to be his birthday. So it was a it was a celebration for the win and for his birthday on that Sunday in this house. And by the way, it was Wrestling Training Illustrated. Wrestling Training, exactly. Yes. And uh, and, and fellow Scott Epstein, mm -hmm. uh, rest his soul. Scott was yeah. there too at, at the uh, at the party afterwards. Oh, he was. Yeah. yeah. They were and that was not Scott. That was not Scott on the tape. No, that was Friedman, right? I believe sound like so. sound like Stan, sound like Stan. Yeah. After I heard it again, uh, but uh, you know, over that championship run, uh, you know, Billy did go sometimes to other territories. I remember that uh, show in St. Louis that we were both at, and we had dinner with Billy and hung out with him. And then he worked against uh, Jimmy Valiant, and uh, but uh, that run was uh, not long enough. A lot of people felt that um, mm -hmm. uh, he was selling tickets. He had that charisma. And people were cheering him sometimes more than booing him. Well, that's that was the problem. People were cheering him, and you don't cheer a, a bad guy, you know, like he's a villain. Not getting, you don't really cheer for the the villain as much as he was getting cheered. He was getting a bigger response than the uh, 
his opponent, the baby face, the good guy, yeah, was in a bigger response. And the WWE didn't know WWWF, sorry, didn't know how to handle that. They they were a little <laughs> surprised. Yeah. But what, yeah. what they had what they had in the making was Hulk Hogan before Hulk Hogan is what is what it was. That was the response he was getting. Yeah, I, I believe that if they would have turned him babyface during that run, he could have probably held on for a long time. But uh, it was uh, it was an amazing run that he had, and um, and then of course he loses to Backlund in '78. Um, the run but, is over. But if you can back up a bit in the Garden, you would see some great great matches with uh, Superstar, and uh, my my favorite two really stick out against Dusty Rhodes in a bull rope match. Great. Unlike Classic. anything else that you've seen in the garden at any other time. You know, Classic actually. match. And then against Mil Mascaris. Yeah. My my, my my favorite was against Mil Mascaris, though. Uh, the match with Dusty was great with the bull rope. But uh, now with, between Mascaris and Graham, you had two colorful guys. You had two of the guys that were top of their game at that moment going at it in Madison Square Garden. That was That was my favorite, though. So Dusty, I, I put it right there, one one A, you know, like, was was great. So during that run, those were the two, those were the two matches that stand out more than anything to you. Was oh, it was sure. Graham against Rhodes, Graham against Mil Mascaris. Correct. Wow. No question. Uh, that, that, I mean, uh, he had other opponents, Billy White Wolf, and uh, yeah, and others that, that were around at that I'm time. Sure Put Putski at the time too was probably yeah. in there. And, and, and just to go back to. Uh, but that interview, I remember uh, having Billy having a whole lot of uh, arm wrestling contests with Ivan Putsky. Yes. Yes. I know I had pictures of uh, uh, a. And, and, and Putsky kind of uh, emulated Billy in regard to it's physique big. and bodybuilding, right? Well, see, Putsky started as bare barreled, uh, round chested. Oh, yeah. Short, but you didn't think he was that small at that time. And he had no body. He was just a big Polish guy, yeah. and he emulated Bruno. And you know, all of a sudden, after a lot of training, Putski got this muscular look. It was a whole different Ivan Putski than uh, than the Ivan Putski. Yeah, that that transformation was pretty astounding to see the beer barrel Putski, Polish power Putski, all of a sudden, you know, kind of transforms his body into this incredibly cut physique. Yeah, well, Billy was the uh, the had the best physique in in the business so uh maybe uh jesse the body might might object but but billy billy was a little annoyed that jesse the body copied his uh his ring attire and style and whatever yeah. you know he could copy yeah. it but it wasn't the same after uh, after the title loss um and Billy uh, leaving the territory. Did you guys? How how often did were you in touch with? Okay, well, that, that, all of a sudden, he it was like he fell off the face of the earth. He just disappeared, and for a couple of years, you didn't hear him. He wasn't anywhere. I understand uh, he was uh, he wasn't feeling that good. He was a little sick. He had some issues, and he just dropped out of sight. I got. Um, a couple calls out of the blue. Hey, uh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm coming back. But he never would pin himself down. And then when he came back, he did come back. And he he wasn't the superstar. He was this. He was the Karate Kid. Yeah. He came back as a whole different thing with the uh, karate gear and the, and he didn't have the same. I wouldn't say the same charisma. He didn't have the same. He didn't have the same look. It was the same person with a with a different gimmick, so to say. And it didn't get over as well as his previous persona. But at that time, it was a couple of years later, his, uh, his body was beat and he wasn't, he still was in good shape, but he wasn't in superstar shape. Uh, he right. had prior to that. And when, uh, when was the last time you saw or spoke to Billy George? Oh, it's. Uh, would you say the, the 90s or 2000s or after that? Uh, no, it, it certainly was within a year or two. A year or two? Yeah, 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 for sure. A year or two. And uh, he, he wasn't feeling well, but he really wouldn't let on as to how bad he was. People knew how bad he was, but he wouldn't admit it verbally. He wouldn't verbalize 
what what really the issues were. Yeah. You know. And of course, uh, we we lost him a few weeks ago. And um, out of everybody that you covered, I mean, where do you place the legacy of superstar Billy Graham in the history of the business? Well, first of all, as I previously said, superstar was Hulk Hogan before Hulk Hogan. He had the pythons. Before yeah. Hulk Hogan, but then when in, in that interview, and he said 22 inches, I remember there were 24, but that's a different story. And then uh, Hulk went and did his uh, his interview, sorta. And where would you put him? I still, I personally still put Hulk Hogan up there because of what he did and how he really changed the business. People that have a negative attitude about Hulk Hogan at this moment or whatever, he still was number one. Graham is right down there, a uh, couple notches behind, if that. But in his day, you can't compare different eras, different decades. You got to go by the decade. He was the best in his time. Hulk Hogan was the best in his time. The Rock, Austin were the best in their time. Right. Ric Flair was the best overall. Yeah. Yeah. Well, his legacy will never be forgotten. Uh, I mean, just to look at the response on social media all the pictures that are up there many of them yours uh it was uh, something that even though we knew that billy was in ill health and when he passed yeah i've seen uh i've seen really just uh so much on uh of people remembering him and and he will be remembered forever regardless of the controversies he changed the game he brought a new look style Charisma into pro wrestling that it really hadn't seen, uh, and uh, well, they, you know, they, there were guys in the in the sixties and fifties. Uh, well, you have Gorgeous George, which is a flamboyant George. one, and also his his namesake, the, the the Graham brothers would come out flashy, and the Fargo brothers prior to that, but he just t- he just took it to a different he level. Took it to a different level. George, it's a pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure to uh, I thank you so much for coming on this tribute to Billy Graham. And um, I really hope to run into you at a Met game or a wrestling convention or somewhere down the road. That would be nice. New York. Yeah. Or come down to Nashville anytime, my friend. Well, uh, thank you for taking care of me when I was in Nashville for the Ric Flair. Uh, yes. And yeah. For his last match and we uh, SummerSlam and uh, it was a, it was a, it was a fun time for, for a couple of days hanging with you again. It really was. Yeah. Brought back brought back great memories and every memory I have of you stays in my mind forever because you are to me, uh, somebody that, uh, I, I admire respect and, uh, your legacy and legend in pro wrestling is unsurpassed, my friend. Well, thank you very much. All right, George, thank you. Thank and, you. uh, we'll see you soon. Okay. I hope so. Thank you. Take care. George Napolitano, somebody that uh, I've certainly known for 50 plus years. It was great to see him and great to hear his uh, stories and him reminiscing about the great superstar Billy Graham. Uh, Our next guest on this special tribute is a gentleman that actually uh, wrote with Billy Graham uh, the uh, biography that came out in 2007. Uh, It was uh, Billy Graham's story, Tangled Ropes. Uh, and this gentleman, just a world-renowned author, uh, and he also was the person who put together the Freddie Blassie book, and I just adored that one as well. So, but without any further ado, to talk about superstar Billy Graham today, Keith Elliott Greenberg, and let's bring on Keith right now. How you doing, hey, my friend? John. Thank you so much for inviting me on the show, and what a great interview you just did with George. He's one of my favorite people. And um, he remains a favorite of many wrestlers who's with, with uh, whose paths crossed with his. Oh, absolutely. And it was great to see you a few weeks ago at uh, Tommy Fierro's 80s yeah, it was wrestling. A, it, was a, it was a nice surprise. I didn't expect to see you in New York. Yeah. Well, I try to get up there when I can. And, uh, uh, but it was really good to see you, and um, as, as it is always, you're just kind of a really cool dude, and and your career has been incredible. Uh, your books, I mean, how many books 
have you written? Of? Well, I've written over, if you count children's books, I've written over 40 books. Oh my but, goodness. you know, I've been, you know, like yourself, we're both fortunate to look a lot more youthful than we are. So uh, <laughs> I've been knocking around. I started at 19. I had my first thing published at 19. So I have been, you know, generating income as a writer for 45 years. And um, yeah, so in that time, you know, if you count children's books and children's books, I can sometimes write quickly, although they have their own challenges, especially the ones for uh, early readers, because it's hard to break things down in ways they understand and keep yeah. the word count low. It's, yeah. it's, it's over 40 books. Yeah, I mean, the one that kind of stands out to me, I mean, uh, was uh, December 8th, 1980, the day John Lennon died. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of people bring that book up. And usually yeah. when uh, people meet me for the first time and they're, and they're not wrestling fans, I say, uh, if they say, which book uh, should I read? I usually direct them there unless they're, if they're wrestling fans, I direct, I usually direct them to the Blassie or the Graham book. Yeah. And um, if they're true crime buffs, I direct them to one of my true crime books. Well, storied career, as we said, uh, let's uh, let's talk about superstar Billy Graham. When did you first uh, meet Billy? You know, that's a hard question. And I've been thinking about this lately because I was such a fan of his that I almost felt like I knew him. And I guess, you know, later on when I was uh, writing for the WWE's magazines, you know, I would meet these fans and they would they would talk about the wrestlers like they had these personal relationships with them. And I'd go, what? These people are nuts. They're fanatics. And then I realized I was like that. So, you know, you see superstar Billy Graham or Bruno on the other side of the TV, and you're young enough to really invest in them. Uh, I don't remember when we first had a conversation. I mean, I started writing... I started writing about wrestling in around 81. I was freelancing. I was not associated with uh, WWE at the time. So you were doing magazine work? Is that what you're doing? I'm doing some magazine work. I'm doing newspaper work. Mm -hmm. I did a story maybe around 82 for the New York Daily News about um, the professional wrestling phenomenon. How is it that with you know, just exposure on a small TV network at an out of the way time, uh, Madison Square Garden sells out and Bob Backlund is considered a hero to millions and unknown by most. You know, I did a story for Us Weekly on Bruno San Martino's disappointment that his son went into the family business. He wanted him to get an education, you know, proud immigrant father. Um, so, you know, I was briefly doing a wrestling column for the Staten Island Advance. And, uh, you know, so I was knocking around. And I probably first encountered superstar Billy Graham, I'm guessing, around 82 when he was in doing his karate gimmick. Okay. But when he came back in, in around 86, that's when I really began talking to him. Because at that point... I was, uh, even though I was always a freelancer, I was entrenched in that WWE machine. I was writing three to four articles for their magazine every month. I was writing stuff for the program. I was, eventually, I was even writing parts of their annual reports, you know, because wow. I was, I had a monthly retainer. Um, it was always about the wrestling portion of things. I was writing copy for when they went into new, not new territories, new countries. And, um, you know, so I was backstage a lot. And of course, he's a guy, as you remember, who will draw you to him. And, uh, you know, he's a smart guy. And he also was an exceptional artist. And, you know, when I first started uh, college, I thought I was going to be a fine artist. So we had that in common, too. And we both liked Bob Dylan. And I, I named one of my kids Dylan. So, you know, uh -huh. that was, you know, <laughs> superstar Billy Graham and Dusty Rhodes used to compete 
uh, about who could work in Bob Dylan lyrics into their promos. Yeah, and Dusty would no come kidding. Out and go, yeah, he goes, it's just a simple twist of fate that brought us together. <laughs> Very cool story, and um, and and you, um, I guess you went. Did you ever go to work? You were full time with WWE. I wasn't. I was never full. Never full time. I was never an office guy. I always had other jobs on the side. Okay, so you were just kind of this. But I was uh, on retainer. I received a monthly retainer, and I was around. You know, I'd say at least every three weeks, sometimes more often. I was at the office stage. checking in and uh and you what know, the... I'd be backstage for a couple of days of TV usually. Yeah. Yeah. So you had kind of free access, you got to know everybody and Yeah, uh... I got to know everybody. I got to learn the rules early on. Mm -hmm. Um Pat Patterson was very helpful in that regard. Uh very early on one of the first lessons I learned was stay out of the changing room. It's okay to be in the backstage corridor. Right. But that was their private area. And, you know, I remember at first, you know, Pat, you know, he wanted to know who I was and why yeah. I was back there. We'd met before, but he didn't remember. And um, then he, I allowed him to take charge. And I said, how about I wait over here and I'll tell you who I want. And you just bring them to me so I'm not pestering everybody. Now, uh, my goal was to have access, and I knew I would get it, but I wanted to get on his right side. And yeah. then he said, you know what? If you keep behaving like this, you will be one of these guys who came in from the outside who everybody respects. And that was how, it, I mean, you know, there was only one show where I needed to do that. From that point forward, I could pretty much go wherever I pleased. Yeah. Once you get that trust and once yeah. they know that you're okay, then it gets easier. Yeah. I have a memory that I never talk about, but it came up, you know, I'm doing another book. I'm doing a book about how WrestleMania three transformed the industry. And I was interviewing Cowboy Bill Watts yesterday. Oh, and he was okay. talking a lot about the junkyard dog. And I had this memory. I have no idea where we were. It could have been anywhere in the country. And some fan kind of walked into the dressing room. He like evaded security and kind of strolled in like he belonged there. And, you know, a bunch of guys are sitting around and he's like standing behind the junkyard dog, you know, as the junkyard dog is having a conversation. <laughs> you know, no one's really noticing him. And then suddenly Chief J Strongbow, like eyes the guy and he's like, who are you, sir? And the fan just loses control. He's been holding it all in. He's just like, you guys are great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they drag him out. And I remember the junkyard dog was just on the floor laughing. <laughs> you know? Wow. That is funny. When you get into that territory, I mean, I, you know, I, I, that sacred ground, that dressing room area. I mean, you could stay in the corridor, you could stay in the hallway. Um, and I remember uh, when I, did that crazy experiment of wrestling one yeah, night. I, know. I've seen uh, I was in that sacred ground and it was, uh, for me, I was like, what am I even doing in here? Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Uh, but, uh, the, the, the book on Billy, I mean, you know so much about Billy. You've had obviously the, the relationship, the, the book together, and, um, you really have a lot of insight into what was going on with superstar Billy Graham, especially, uh, when it comes to those latter uh, months uh, of him holding the title and uh, and then when he eventually lost to Backlund on February 20th of 78, uh, it kind of took a turn for Billy where George was alluding to that he just kind of dropped out of sight. So, yeah. uh, so we're going to pick it up from where George left off, really. On uh, I, I, I do want to elaborate on something George said. Okay. Um, and George and I were talking about this uh, with you uh, earlier when we were recording, um, you know, in, in my book, I erroneously said that uh, once superstar Billy Graham won the title, he jumped into a taxi. And that's what, you know, Wayne rem or, you know, superstar remembered that he jumped mm. into a taxi and uh, took a, ta a taxi. Uh, 
And it turns out, as George recalls accurately, that no, he had George drive him back to New York and they ate at a rest stop. Mm -hmm. I think what happened, but that was how Superstar remembered it. Um, and so I didn't feel the need to cross-reference it because I figured that was a pretty vivid memory. Mm -hmm. I think uh, now, after listening to George earlier today on your show, I think what uh, Superstar was probably confusing the night he won with another night because he had a number of rematches with Bruno. And as you remember, Vince McMahon Sr., Vincent James McMahon, would put the champion on in the middle of the show. Yes, and always. Then, and then there'd be an intermission. Mm -hmm. And then they'd come back, you know, from the intermission. And then before the final match of the night, they'd announce the next month's card. Mm -hmm. and so, And you could run down and buy tickets on the spot. Mm -hmm. So I think what happened was superstar Billy Graham had one of his rematches with Bruno somewhere. The fans wanted to kill him by now it had sunken in that he'd actually won the title. And then he ran out and hailed a taxi. And it was a surreal scene because here the fans inside want to tear him apart. And he's standing outside the arena where there are no fans on an empty street right outside the arena where all of the, all the thousands of them could get at him. And he hails a taxi and he's sweating and he's wearing his ring gear and he goes to the hotel. So I think that's, that's probably another night. Yeah. That's definitely a good assessment of what, uh, of what happened. Um, likely happened. Yeah. But likely happened, of course. Um, but, uh, were you, um, were you kind of when you were doing this book with Billy and he started talking about and you guys were talking about those days after him losing the backland? I mean, it really it hit him hard. It kind of pulled the rug hard. out from under him. Yeah. And it's it's, uh, you know, I was talking about this on Busted Open Radio and Bully Ray said he didn't understand why um, it hit him so hard because you know, because we're all in this business. We know that you pretty much do as you're told. Nobody likes losing. And, you know, when you think about it, it like he had a, a pretty long run, nine and a half months as champion and really made an impact. I mean, everyone remembers him. I mean, look at the tributes that are continuing to pour in. And, um, you know, Billy saw that the fans were really taking to him. That he wanted to have a run as a baby face. And he wanted Vince McMahon Sr. to revise his plan and let him keep the championship. And Vince McMahon Sr., you know, he was doctrinaire. He told him that the three of them had a meeting. It was Eddie Graham was involved in this. They were on Vince McMahon Sr.'s yacht below deck and uh, with Eddie Graham sitting there, um, you know, Vince McMahon senior laid it out. He said, you're going to win the title on this day and you're going to lose it on this specific day. It was that much detail. And Bob Backlund is going to beat you. He's down here working the Florida territory. He's not ready to be the champ yet, but in nine months he will be, or in the nine month time, after, you know, you've held the championship, he will be. And Vince Sr. said, I'm going with that plan. Because And they gave Backlund that long buildup, for sure. They gave it, a yes, a long buildup. And, you know, look, I remember it being kind of an exciting buildup, you know, as um, I don't want to, uh, you know, the, the, the big knock that people had on Backlund was that he lacked color. And certainly... Uh, in a place like the Northeast, after you've had these champions like Bruno and Pedro, who would elicit an extremely emotional response from yeah, it was always an ethnic champion for many yes, there was. years, almost decades, and then Graham was kind of the first guy that was well, Stacey. Right. He wasn't, it wasn't me. ethnic, but he no. he suited the times. He did. He was so flamboyant. He was so much larger than life. He fit perfectly in New York. And, and the other Northeastern cities. 
And as I pointed out when I was talking to the guys from Busted Open, these were ECW towns. Like this is the mentality that the fans had. These are extreme fans. And Graham just hit them in the right place. They he hit everybody in the right place. And he was one of those villains that everybody kind of loved, just like Ric Flair later on. You know, after a while, even when the four horsemen did devious things, everybody loved seeing Ric Flair. And so um, Graham just couldn't handle not being the champion anymore. Yeah. And it messed with him. He really had something of a breakdown. And... Um, removed himself. It's like George Napolitano was saying the story, you know, t talking about he disappeared, like George was with his buddy, like he received uh, his mail at George's home and suddenly he's not communicating with George. And, um, you know, a lot has to be said for superstar Billy Graham's wife, Valerie. Yes. Who, he married her in 1978, you know, when he had the title, I believe. Mm -hmm. And she was a, a very young and she stayed with him all these years. And she had the good times and she had a lot of the bad times. And I'll be at the funeral and I'm, I'm proud. You know, I, I had to go to the funeral. Like yeah. there wasn't even it wasn't even an option in my mind. Um, and, you know, you know, now she has to pay the funeral expenses. And, you know, I'm sure the medical bills are going to come. And there's forward. a GoFundMe set up. For, um, I for need her. to really discuss this with her because, yeah. you know, she needs help. And this is yeah. not a work. This no, is I know a 100 percent unequivocal shoot. Yeah. She is going to be bombarded with medical bills. And anybody who has had a loved one die, die knows that when you're grieving, now you're being zapped by by, by the bill collector. Right. And she needs everybody's help. She does. So, but, uh, but she was dealing with him during that depression when he went into that dark frame of mind. They're newlyweds. And he's shot from, from losing the title. He's removed himself. He's not talking to people. People aren't sure if he's in the wrestling world once in a while. Like he turned up in Houston at one point with his head shaved and wrestled Bruno. And, um, you know, then in 82, he returns with the Kung Fu gimmick. I think there was some self-sabotage there. He, um, he didn't know martial arts. He comes in, he doesn't tell anybody that, um, you know, he's doing this. Vince McMahon Jr. has just bought the company from his father. He didn't tell. He didn't tell them that he was changing his gimmick and his look. And wait, wait, he, sorry. No, I'm he sorry, froze. but but Billy didn't when he came in with the kung fu gimmick. He didn't tell anyone before he came in that he was going to change his whole persona. He did not. Wow. He did not. And 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 Vince McMahon Jr. has just bought the company, and you know. Yeah. He's a he's a superstar Billy Graham fan. He told oh, yeah. me personally, he yeah. goes, he would have been my Hulk Hogan. Yeah. He thought that superstar Billy Graham's idea about turning himself baby face and having an extended run with the title was a good idea. Yeah. He supported that idea. It was his father who was more conservative and yeah. more stuck it in, in, in his ways. And who knows, you know, then as Vince McMahon Jr. aged. People said he was stubborn and unbending. You know, it's easy to second guess when you're not the one making the final decisions. Um, but uh, he's thinking, I'm bringing back superstar Billy Graham, the guy with the pythons, the guy with the jive talking, the guy in the psychedelic outfits. It's going to be great. And instead, he gets this like depleted man with a shaved head doing bad kung fu moves because he doesn't know martial arts and he's like billy i wish you would have like given me a warning before you came in with this gimmick yeah and he should have given him a warning he was owed that and i think there was a part of him that wanted to fail i think that was how he was viewing himself at that point wow and if you remember vince mcmahon jr 
he had a warm spot for him. It's funny. We talk about the Graham brothers. Now, the Graham brothers is an invented concept. They None of them were brothers. But any, but they they all play a role. They're all associated with McMahons. I mean, they, there's really there's a legacy there with the Grahams and the WWF. Right. And, 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 the and they, they're family. all like woven into this tale. Jerry yeah. Graham, of course, gets superstar, gives superstar Billy Graham the Graham name. Yeah. Now, you know, they've already had crazy Luke Graham. That's now they say, you know, he goes, which Graham brother do you want to be? And because, you know, Billy grew up, uh, you know, Wayne grew up uh, 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 as a traveling evangelist. Yes. Uh, you, or since he was a teenager and he loves these fundamentalist, charismatic preachers. He's like, I want to be Billy Graham, like <laughs> Reverend Billy Graham. And then... Vince McMahon Sr. has this warm spot for Jerry Graham. Jerry Graham is a total screw up and he screws up and he drinks too much and he causes fights on planes and in bars and the cops are involved and Vince McMahon Sr. keeps bringing them back. Eddie Graham becomes this booking genius in Florida He's involved with Billy Graham, his gimmick brother, getting the title. It's him and Vince McMahon Sr. explaining this. And then Vince McMahon Jr., he looks at Billy Graham as the one who got away. Like, if only I were five years older or six years older, uh, you know, I'd own the company and he'd be my champion. So he keeps bringing him back. He brings him back in 82. Yeah. And then he brings him back as a wrestler in 86 when superstar Billy Graham needs a hip replacement, yep. largely because of the joint degeneration from years of steroids. steroids yeah. And, you know, superstar Billy Graham kayfabes Vince McMahon. Like, everybody likes to talk about ruthless Mr. McMahon. Well, you know, Vince McMahon got played a lot also. And superstar Billy Graham knew he had a soft spot. Yeah, I mean, McMahon... Um obviously was enamored with Billy Graham when Billy came in and when Billy had the title and you just see it in the way the promos were cut and the way McMahon interviewed him. It was always, it was a special relationship. Yes, and, yes. and I think over the course of history, even, you know, unfortunately to this day, that warm spot that McMahon Jr. had for Billy Graham stayed with him forever. Yes, and there is there Billy is a connection. Richard. There is a connection there, and and that has to be that there could be a book written about just those two, the relationship yeah, with those absolutely. two. Absolutely, because and, and think about it. Vince has had the connections with dozens of people. Yeah, very special connection. But he never had the soft spot that he had with Billy that he had for Billy Graham, even with all the. You know, the steroid era, the, the allegations, the Donahue show. I mean, you know better that. than anybody, John. You oh, I know. I was in the middle of the, all of that stuff back then. That's why my time with Billy Graham, as, aside from the Napolitano days in the 70s, where I, I'd be so shy around them, but I love shooting pictures of them and, uh, you know, had dinner with them, with George and all of that. I really didn't get to, you know, interact with Billy in a big way until all the steroid stuff broke up and he right. was on my show and we broke stories and all of that. But going back to him and Vince, there was something between the two of them. Well, you know, obviously if they they had an affinity for each other. Yes, they, they had did. a bond and a connection with each other, which probably lasted to the day that Billy Graham passed yes, away. Yes, even though they didn't talk for years, even yeah. though they were strained, even though Billy Graham would get on the internet and say horrible things about Vince McMahon. Yeah. It was almost like a child lashing out at a parent. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it was not born of hate. It was born on hurt. And it was born of a need perhaps to get attention because he was hurting. He yeah. was hurting in a way where I guess he needed, he wanted someone to come in and embrace him again. He probably wanted Vince to embrace him again. Yeah. And, you know, but he burned a lot of bridges. He did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the sad part of the whole story. I mean, it's, 
And, and the sad part of the story, again, I can't emphasize enough. Valerie stuck with him. His wife yes. was there. His wife was there through his liver transplant. His life was there as he suffered, you know, numerous health problems, as he went through surgeries, as his moods went up and down. And, you know, when he was isolated and he had isolated himself, the people from his church told me, you know, he removed himself. You know, it's like George, you know, was trying to get a hold of him. And his wife was always there next to him. And his wife was going to work every day and paying the bills. And, you know, this is, you know, people say, oh, she's a saint. She's a hero. And she said to me, no, I'm not. I married him and I made a commitment to him. That's what I am. I was his wife. That was, you know, my job, just like he would have stuck with me. Mm -hmm. So that was built on strong love and faith and commitment to each other. And faith. And let's not forget, Valerie's parents were in the business. Valerie's father was Chris Belkas, who was a Greek wrestler. And uh, her mother was Sherry Lee, who, if you if you look at um, the photos of Sherry Lee, if you find it, um, she was a beautiful looking woman. I mean, if she had come around, you know, in uh, recent, you know, the last generation, everyone would know who she was. She was stunning. And uh, Valerie is quite beautiful also. And I think that's because of both her mother and her father. Um, yeah. But she grew up in the business. She was not a wrestling person. Her thing was the church. Her thing was scripture. Um, her thing was faith. And she had that connection with Billy. But let's not forget, she grew up in the business. So they had that deep connection. And you know what? She was related to Sky High Lee, who was nope. one of wow. who was one of superstar Billy Graham's uh, the, uh, a wrestler who fascinated him when he was yeah. a kid watching yeah. wrestling in Phoenix. Yeah, I remember reading stories about Sky High yeah. back then. Yeah. He, he wow. had a agromegaly, the same. Yes, exactly. Yeah, he was huge. Yeah, yes, yeah, I yeah. remember him. And, wow. But he had the big chin. I think yes, he did. Yes. Did, it did, I mean, Baba, I think, had, had it. Baba, some, too. Yeah, it looks like you know, Baba had And, um, you know, I think, um, you know, there are, there are other people like in recent years, they were able to get the pituitary gland removed. Like the big show told me he had the gland removed. But um, yeah, we've had uh, more more than our share, like the Swedish angel, if, when you see photos of him, mm -hmm. you know, th those guys all had agromegaly. Egg yeah. And I, I don't think Anoki did. I think Anoki just had a very prominent chin. He had a prominent chin, yeah. But but absolutely. Baba, you could see, had some giantism. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Graham um, book that came out in 2007, I mean, you work closely with Billy on it, and it's certainly um, uh, out there f still for people to get that book and, and read yes. about it. And Tangled Ropes is the name. Yes, yes, exactly, Tangled Ropes. And uh, I do have a copy of that as well. I think I bought it just around the time it came out. Um, I think Billy mentioned me in it a couple of times. Uh, he did. Um, but uh, you, I mean, as far as your relationship with Billy towards the end uh, and Valerie, um, can you share with us? Yeah, uh, I, 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 was, you guys? I was fortunate. Um, they would communicate with me, mm -hmm. you know, partic at, particularly Valerie as he, uh, as his health declined. Uh, as his health declined, it became obvious that he wasn't going to make it. Um, Valerie is a woman of faith. Um, she saw it differently than I. And look, uh, he lived 21 years past his liver transplant, even with a liver transplant. In a way, that's a miracle itself. It, it is a miracle. So she saw miracles around yeah. her and the, 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 and she wasn't delusional. I mean, no, not, that's he, why at the end, when they had to put him on life support, she said she's had she miracles. Refused. Before. She refused to put him on life support. She, right. she or take him off. Yeah. She turned to God. She was like, faith will bring us, will bring him through. And look, there were times when, you know, he'd get pneumonia. He was about to die. And then I'd get photos from, from Valerie um, of him 
sitting up in a wheelchair, smiling. And it's like, he's not going to die. He's, he's indestructible. I mean, so uh, it was clear to me that he was going to go soon. And I had, my mother died in January. Then February 2nd, uh, Lanny Poffo dies. And I was quite close to Lanny. Then February 2nd happened to be the birthday of my friend, Tom Steven, who I also wrote a book with. He was the drummer of the Jeff Healy band. February 8th, Tom Steven dies. So it's like, now I have three deaths in like three weeks. And um, I just said to myself, and I'm not a person of faith. I just don't want anyone to die in March. I'm like in my head. I'm making a deal with superstar Billy Graham. I'm not praying. I'm at, just asking, like, please don't die. Don't die in March. Like, I want to go one month without somebody dying. And as I wrote in a recent article for Inside the Ropes magazine, because I'm a monthly columnist for Inside mm -hmm. the Ropes, uh, I wrote, uh, not only did he not die in March, he didn't die in April either. So he gave me two months. And that's how I looked at it, very selfishly. He gave me two months. And a, a few weeks ago, I said to Valerie, can I please come out to see him? And she said, he, he doesn't want to see anybody because he had lost 80 pounds. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, he doesn't want anyone to see him in his condition. And his son had come out there and she goes, he even says he won't see his son. And I'm like, that's heartbreaking because his son had already paid for his ticket. His son just came. His son's like, I'm going. And, um, you know, he, he relented. He let his son see him and they had a nice visit. And then he let his daughter see him. And I believe his daughter was with him at the very end. And here's the thing. His daughter hated Bob Dylan. And at one point, his daughter, you know, it was like the day before Billy died, she took her phone out and started playing Bob Dylan songs and put it on the pillow next to him. And, uh, you know, she's like, if you don't think I love you now, you know, you're never going to know. And so, they're, they're, and everyone was smiling. So, yeah. you know, it wasn't all bad. And I can see why Valerie, you know, was holding on to him because for all the gloomy times, there were fun times and he was fun. And he was smart and he read about all kinds of different topics and he could paint and he went to art museums. And so there was so much to him that, you know, the fans, we glean that because he would incorporate everything into his overall presentation. But if you took wrestling out of it, he was still a fascinating guy. And I'm fortunate because look, I, I've been thinking about this this year after losing so many people. On the one hand, it's shattering to lose people you care about. On the other hand, I think, look, some pretty great, interesting people have come into my life. Superstar mm -hmm. Billy Graham, Lanny Poffo, Tom Steven from the Jeff Healy band. You know, if my life ended now, I'm not, it, it wasn't all that bad. Look at the people I was, that, that I, that I was grieving because I got to know them so much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what a storied career you've had and the relationships that you developed, the books that you've written, uh, uh, Billy Graham, certainly one of the most complex individuals ever to, to be in a wrestling business. <laughs> and, and in general, a very complex individual. Good. Yeah. But uh, we want to thank you for uh, doing this today. This has been, um, you know, the inside stuff you're talking about. I mean, the history that you've had with Billy, uh, it, it just very much appreciated. I mean, for me, I the guy in the 70s, I just couldn't believe that. He, look at the way the business is heading with this individual that people just loved, even though he was a, a heel. Right. And then getting to do some, you know, getting him on my radio show in 1990 for the first time and all of that stuff that went on through the, the scandals. But then the highlight for me was bringing him to to my convention in 91 when he was there with Bruno and Buddy Rogers and Ric Flair and Luthez 
You know, I wish and there that, was a photo of all those guys together. I have it. I do. You I have. have I have. Who's in the oh, photo? absolutely. I who's have in the a, photo? Yeah, it's uh, it's Graham. Mm -hmm. It's Luthez. It's Ric Flair. It's uh, Bruno? Buddy Rogers. Bruno's not in it. Bruno no, didn't Bruno want Bruno and Buddy Rogers were. Yeah, were yeah, yeah. It was like they did convince them to take a picture together at that convention, but they later on group shot. Bruno was not in the group shot, and I believe Rick Rude. Uh, there's some different, you know, variations of it. Yeah. Rick Root and, and Nancy Woman uh, was was there as well. And you know what? They're all gone except I for know. Flair. They're all gone. Right? They're all every every name gone. Yes, and I think about that too. You know, yeah, you know, like the last two books I've written. I wrote a book about indie wrestling that came out in 2020, and I wrote a book about pro wrestling and COVID uh, during the COVID era. And mm -hmm. that came out in October. And I wanted to write those books because I wanted to be writing contemporary stuff. I didn't want to be seen as someone who only talks of the oldest. But now I've decided to do a book about WrestleMania three because I've established my bona fides. I'm not mm -hmm. just seen as an old man dwelling on the past, but it's important to preserve history. And if I don't grab these guys now, I'm going to lose them. And so right. I've not only been interviewing people who participated in WrestleMania three and, you know, like jumping Jim Brunzel is in his seventies. Now um, mm -hmm. I, I interviewed Bill Watts yesterday. I interviewed Greg Gagne a few days ago. I interviewed David Crockett the other day. Ke Kevin Von Erich has returned my call. I have to get these voices of you what do. it was like, you know, in the territories while Vince is taking over. Because if I don't get that stuff, that story will not be told properly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that work has got to continue, Keith. Yeah. You got to, yeah, because I, I think about it all the time. I mean, because history in the wrestling business is quite unusual because yes, it it's not it's not cared about the way it should be. No. And so it should be treated the way you treat any other history. Right. Music history, sports history. Are some of the stories exaggerated? You're telling me George Washington chopping down the cherry tree and throwing a silver dollar across the Potomac is, isn't is exaggerated, is not a work. So, you know, you just have to take that stuff with for what it is, but you have to get it down. That's right. Well, you continue the good work that you're doing help preserve the history. And uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here today. And you know what? Every time like you communicate with me, like you're like, can you make it tomorrow? It's like, if it's for John Arezzi, I'll figure out a way. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Keith Elliott Greenberg uh, with his memories and great stories. And he was in touch with the family, right? in the end to the end. Um, so uh, fascinating stuff from Keith and also George and Napo George Napolitano earlier. Uh, that's going to wrap up this uh, special tribute to a special person in the history of professional wrestling, superstar, Billy Graham. Uh, I want to thank uh, Marsh, our creative director, our producer uh, for, uh, for his work on this. Uh, I also, of course, always want to thank our Patreon executive producers, Anthony Pyrus and Joseph Holloway. Uh, I, um, you know, you, 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 you do a show like this. And of course, Billy was in ill health for a lot of years. But uh, hearing the stories, having the memories of superstar Billy Graham, uh, somebody that will live forever in the world of pro wrestling. That'll wrap it up. My name is John Arezzi. We'll talk more wrestling with you and relive more history with you on the next episode of the Pro Wrestling Spotlight Podcast. And uh, this was indeed a very special edition of our show. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for listening or watching our YouTube.